requires that more than 55% of the cost of components uh, must be manufactured in the United States. And then importantly, the product itself must be manufactured in the United States, but that does not mean that all components must be required in the United States, but must be produced in the United States. Um, so there is kind of a couple of different bars that you do need to hit. So that 55% rule um, that the product must be manufactured in the United States and that it does not require all components to be produced in the United States are the big takeaways there. How is the cost of components of a manufactured product determined? So this is the kind of math equation that will be used um, to determine if your manufactured product uh, fits under Buy America. So first, determine the, co determine the components manufactured in the United States. Then you must determine the cost of those components manufactured, manufactured in the United States. Determine the cost of all components. And then finally, you divide the cost determined in step two by the cost determined in step three. So a fairly simple division equation, but that is what you'll have to do in order to prove that um, your manufactured product meets that 55% rule and complies with Buy America. Moving on to construction materials. So the other expansion, um, what is considered a construction material in this guidance. So you'll see the list here, uh, non-ferrous metals, plastic and polymer based products, um, glass, which is a big for a lot of our members, a uh, fiber optic cable, optical fiber, lumber, engineered wood and drywall. Um, one thing you'll note at the bottom is that cement and some uh, cementitious materials, um, aggregates such as stone, sand and gravel or aggregate binding agents or additives are not considered construction materials. Uh, this is noted because back in the provisional guidance, uh, forever, these materials have never been included by America. The provisional guidance, they open the door and ask the question, should they be included in by America? Um, after the comment period, they were able to come to, come to the conclusion that these uh, would not be included in Buy America. So you see the note there at the bottom. Glass beads. So I mentioned that um, glass is included as a construction material in here. Um, and so what the final guidance states is that OMB uh, went back to what Congress had, in, the, what, what they interpreted Congress's intention to be an IIJA in terms of glass. Uh, being a construction material, and thus they include it as a construction material here in the final guidance. There was a question of whether or not it would be considered a manufactured product, um, but in the end, it turned out to be a construction material. Um, but what they did do at the, at the bottom of their little thing on glass beads is they do kind of open it up to let federal agencies decide um, whether or not some of these uh, products, such as glass beads, and they say glass beads specifically for pavement markings, um, can be uh, justified to, to have to go through the waiver process and be uh, given a public interest waiver. So they do specifically mention glass beads for pavement markings. Um, although they are considered a construction material as of now, they do open it up for federal agencies to um, kind of review whether or not they do want to provide a public uh, a public uh, a public waiver for um, the glass beads. On to temporary products. So a big thing for, I know a lot of ASA members are temporary products. Um, you see there on the right, that is kind of the, the summary of what we see on the left. Um, so temporary products will be exempt from having to comply with uh, Buy America. That's always been the case. However, um, back in the, uh, they've got the uh, memorandum that came out in 2022, uh, they do state that temporary products are exempt. However, in the guidance that came out earlier this year, they do not mention temporary products. Uh, one thing we don't like to do is speak for the federal government. So we did uh, make sure to get clarification about temporary products in this final guidance. Um, and they do state that they that we should use the uh, phrase from the memorandum from 2022 saying that temporary products will be exempt from having to comply with Buy America. Um, and I've gotten some questions on this. So just to kind of visually break it down for everybody. Um, if your product is temporary, you go to the right, you see temporary, exempt from Buy America, it doesn't matter if it's a manufactured product, a construction material, iron and steel, it is, if it's temporary, it is exempt. Um, if it is permanent, if you bring it to the job site and don't take it off, you see the three buckets that we discussed earlier, and those lead down to having to comply uh, with Buy America. So Again, even if you have a manufactured product, if you bring it to the site and take it off, it's temporary, it is exempt from Buy America. The waiver process. So the guidance provides three ways in which um, other exemptions can be made. So the three main waivers that they discuss in terms of uh, Buy America, a public interest waiver, 
so the public interest waiver, I kind of touched on it with glass beads. There's also uh, the, a couple of examples they give, such as if a state has a trade agreement with a foreign country, they can apply for a public interest waiver. So there are some ways in which um, those will be given out. A non-availability waiver. So uh, if you can prove that what you are trying to uh, obtain or make or produce in the United States uh, and you can't make it, you can't find it, there's no quantity of it, um, and you can prove that, then you can apply for a non-availability waiver. Um, and then the 25% uh, un unreasonable cost waiver. So if it will increase the cost of an overall infrastructure product project by more than 25%, you can apply for that unreasonable cost waiver. Now, these waivers won't be easy to obtain. And we'll kind of just quickly go through the waiver process. So you have to request a waiver. Um, again, this is all on you. Um, the federal government will not be doing this for you. This will, you will have to bring them and apply for the waivers um, on your own so that you can request a waiver. Um, and then before they issue a proposed waiver, um, they you have to explain why you believe that this waiver is justified. Um, and then even if you get to that point, then there's a 15 day uh, waiting period where there's public comment on your waiver. And then OMB has the final say on whether or not they want to approve your waiver. So it's not going to be an easy process. Um, it's not going to be just writing a quick paragraph and saying we want this exam. You're going to have to go through a lot of hoops in order to get a waiver, assuming that they want to give it to you. Um, I, I think we wouldn't hold our breath about waivers. I think uh, it's it, the administration's intention to really push to see as many products and materials as possible fall under by America. So um, that's just kind of a note there on the IIJA related waiver process. So what happens now? Um, so the guidance that was officially submitted to the Federal Register, as we mentioned on August 23rd, that means 60 days from now, it will be enacted into law. So that's October 23rd. Again, this is a, this coming from the Office of Management and Budget. This means it's a guidance for federal agencies on how to implement Buy America. Um, what we expect now to happen is that DOT FHWA will release its own guidance on how they will implement this new law. So basically what we have is OMB telling DOT, hey, this is what we want to see you do. Now we're going to turn to DOT and look at them and have them explain to state DOTs, uh, here's how we want you to um, enact this law and here's what we want you to do. So there will be another step here and we will see more information more specific to our industry come out on Buy America. Um, but this this final guidance from OMB kind of sets the stage for what we're going to see in the next couple of weeks and months until we do see something um, from USDOT, hopefully soon. Uh, and a big thing that we want to see, and I know I'm talking to ATSA members, that they all want to see is we want to see a uh, uniform implementation across the board. We want to see clarity on issues. We don't want to see uh, one state look at something, look at a product one way and say this is exempt, and another state look at it and say this is uh, you, this has to comply with Buy America. We don't want to see two different processes for proving that something is made is Buy America. Um, and that's kind of what we've been pushing for over the last couple of weeks and months. Uh, moving on from the IIJA uh, Buy America provision into some of the waivers outside of that. Um, so there is this waiver that was uh, rolled out August 15th on de minimis costs and small grants from US Department of Transportation. Um, you see there in the bold the two uh, ways in which this waiver will kick in, uh, or you can apply for this waiver and have it granted. The total value of the non-compliant products is no more than the lesser of $1 million or 5% of total applicable costs for the project, or the total amount of federal financial assistance applied to the project through awards or subawards is below $500,000. To sum this up, it really is a way in which they want to take the burden off of you to certify commercially available off the shelf products. Um, so if you do buy small products from say, I don't know, a Home Depot, you don't have to go chase the foreman around to say, hey, can you sign off on my waiver um, to prove that this is made in America. Um, and so this is kind of a smaller waiver, but a, a, a way to take some of the burden off the construction industry. The big waiver that we're still waiting to hear back on is this manufactured products waiver. So this waiver has been around for 30, 40 years. Um, and as part of IIJA, it instructs the federal government to review all waivers over five years old. Um, so this waiver is currently under review. Uh, like the uh, guidance earlier this year, there was a comment period on this waiver in which ASA submitted comments on, pushing for the continuation of this waiver. Um, we haven't seen final answer yet. We don't expect it to be continued in its current form. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we expect the intent of the administration to uh, ensure that as many products and materials can fall under the Buy America provision as possible. So 
continuing the manufactured products waiver would take a lot of teeth out of that. So I don't think we have, we have our fingers crossed really that um, we will see uh, that continued. Again, um, if you have any questions, please uh, please put them in the Zoom chat box, the Q&A box. I know I see a good amount, which I'll get to here in a second, but um, just quickly, a, a good amount of ads and members um, kind of emailed me or let me know that they had questions um, ahead of time. So just kind of do a quick Q&A and some things I've heard over the last couple of weeks. Um, how will material purchased prior to the implementation date of Buy America be categorized? Will there be a grace period? Um, as of now, we haven't seen any indication that there will be a grace period. Um, again, we can't speak for what DOT or FHWA intend to do in the future, but as of now, we have not seen any indication of that. Um, purchases from U.S. distributors, who will be required to certify the materials? The burden will be on the contractor to prove that, um, that what they're installing is compliant with Buy America. Um, will state DOTs have guidance on how material certification will be done from US DOT or will each state have their own material certification process? Um, again, we expect additional uh, implementation info from US DOT, FHWA. We don't have a time frame from when that will come out. Obviously, when we do see that, um, we'll, we'll make sure we get that information to you as soon as possible with kind of letting you know what the important details of that are. And that'll obviously be something we'll be looking for uh, when that gets released. Uh, what about uh, Canada, Canadian and Mexican products? Can they fall under the USMCA and be considered domestic? Um, from This is from, a, uh, from the government. It says, typically, federal financial assistance awards are not subject to international trade agreements. I mentioned back in one of the public interest waiver that um, states will probably be able to use that in order to comply with their own international trade agreements. Um, but on the federal level, we don't really see that. Uh, since the dollar value uh, is the rule for the percentage of, of domestic to qualify for Buy America, how often is the recertification required by DOTs every time product is sold monthly? Um, again, we're looking for more guidance from US DOT FHWA on this. Um, initially, our thought would be that uh, every time a project occurs, they'll need to provide that documentation. But again, something to look towards uh, US DOT FHWA for more guidance on that question as well. Uh, and finally, can we include labor and overhead as part of the finished product's domestic value? Um, no, labor is not considered a cost that can count towards the 55% rule. Um, as I mentioned, it is strictly the cost of components that must be part of that 55% um, to get to that threshold. All right, questions from Zoom chat. And I will um, pop open some of these. Uh, All right, Kathy, I'll, I'll throw a question to you as I get going through these. So uh, under the new provision, will it apply also to state funds or just FHWA funding? Uh, and first of all, I apologize for popping in and out. We're having a bad thunderstorm and I lost everything. So I told Cameron, if I freeze, text and let me know and no one take a bad picture of me and send it to me. Um, so this is tied to federal assistance. Um, so if you have a project that combines federal and, and state funding, um, it's still gonna have to be um, compliant with the, the federal Build America, Buy America. Um, I, if you have a project that is entirely state funded, then um, you, these particular requirements would, would not apply. I have a question here. Can you elaborate on if manufactured products are for permanent or temporary on products? Um, I guess just quickly kind of back to that uh, flow chart. If it is temp if it is a temporary product, if it, you do bring it onto the job site and take it off at the end, that would be considered temporary. Uh, so even if it is a manufactured product, it wouldn't have to comply. Kathy, does that sound kosher to you? Yes. Um, another question on manufactured products. It sounds like the manufacturing process has to be domestic, but the raw materials do not need to be. Did I understand that correctly? Let me take, let me handle this a little differently. Um, the guidance talks about raw materials as not having to comply. It doesn't necessarily talk about whether that means they're domestically sourced or, or not. Um, so, and what was the last part of that? Um, it sounds like the manufacturing product process has to be domestic, but the That's raw materials do not need to be. Exactly, exactly, exactly. 
Um, another and, and I see that and I, I just want to make sure that that everyone understands the raw materials as long as they basically aren't, aren't um, altered and and processed when they come to the site um, are not do not have to be by America um, compliant but if there's a manufactured process involved um, then they certainly could could become a manufactured product. Great. Um, another question um, is there. Are we using a temporary products waiver? Um, and do we expect that waiver to be renewed? I, my understanding is that temporary products are just exempt. There is no waiver you have to no, file. Right, there's no waiver that we have to worry about, um, you know, expiring or anything like that. Um, kind of a more specific question, but uh, not too specific enough that we're, I think we can answer it. As for the 55% US content of manufactured product rule, um, which documents do I need to require from my suppliers to prove that my material is produced in the United States? Again, I think this is this will be something that we'll have to see from the USDOT FHWA guidance. Um, again, we don't we we can't we don't know what they're going to be looking for exactly. Um, so that'll be something that we'll have to wait and see on as we get more into the specifics specifics there. Um, and a big thing is just keep in touch with your state DOTs. Let them know what questions you have. Let them know what you want to see so that they can bring it up in conversation when they do talk to their federal partners. Um, and I just, could I just jump in and I, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, it's certainly our hope that there's, there's a standardization of the forms and information as Cameron talked about um, up, uh, across the states so that, um, you know, you, you have one set of rules regardless of where you're doing your, your work. Uh, question here, does labor, labor to manufacture count towards 55%? I know the labor to install does not. So I guess uh, does the labor cost it? Uh, does the labor, the cost of labor to manufacture a product count towards fifty five percent? I would lean towards no because it, again, it's that cost of components is really what it's what we're looking for here. But I don't know, Kathy, if you have anything. I, I mean, I'm I'll go on a limb and say I presume that the cost of the labor to manufacture the component is part of the cost of the component. Um, you know, it's kind of six degrees of separation there, but you know that. It might be included because it's the cost of the component and the labor was part of the cost to, to produce sure. the component. Right. That's, when you yeah. when you buy when you buy a component, the labor's are cost is already built exactly into versus it. versus versus pulling that out specifically. Um that, that might be one way it'll be handled. Mm -hmm. A uh, question here. If a product is predominantly iron or steel, can it be considered a manufactured product? So as I understand it, um as Cameron talked about, there's three buckets. You're either iron and steel construction materials or manufactured product. You're not, you know, you're not going to find yourself in, you know, two or three of the buckets. So as I read these, uh, this guidance, you are an iron and steel product, um, irrespective of what else is added. Right. And, and in the manufacturer, in yeah, in the, in the manufactured product definition, it states that a manufactured product cannot be predominantly iron or steel or a construction material. So that okay. does want to keep those buckets as separate as possible. Exactly. Um, who can apply for a waiver, state DOTs, contractors, or manufacturers? Um, I don't know, Kathy, if you... I mean, I think anyone can apply for the waiver. I'm not sure um, that a state DOT would apply for a waiver mm -hmm. on products. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's any restriction on who can do the application for a waiver for a product. Right. And, and I think from what most you've read and, and heard it, it probably the, a lot of the burden will be on at some membership and our contractors and suppliers and manufacturers to provide this documentation. I, I, I don't think the federal government or that will be making it as easy as possible to get around some of these by America um, um, statutes. Yeah, I, I will say, though, it, um, those of you who've had the, the pleasure of reading all of the documents, and they, they do make a point of saying they're going to continue to try and get input from stakeholders with regard to um, the implementation of this and, and see, you know, what other revisions they may need to make going forward based on what experiences people have. And if you're looking at a waiver, um, even if the state DOT isn't going to be the one to apply for the waiver, they may have some of the information that you'll need in order to support your waiver application. So as Cameron said, I would stay in close touch with your, your state DOTs. Um, another question here, it's kind of more on the procurement side. So it's kind of a follow-up to our temporary product question, whereas if, if 
uh, temporary products are exempt, but um, what if uh, with the DOT or federal contract holder decides to buy some, uh, a temporary product like a message board, a barrel, a cone, um, even if they do bring them on and then take them off that project, if does who procure them, uh, would that impact the Buy America status? So the key phrase is incorporated, incorporated into the project. So if I understand the question, you have a message board, it's brought there on a temporary basis, state DOT buys it, takes it from that project and moves it somewhere else. It's not incorporated in that project. It would still be a temporary product. Um, that's how I, if I understand the question, Cameron. Yeah, that, that's the way I would look at it as well. Um, and I, I think that's kind of the key. And, and it's just remembering that that flow chart is no matter what, if, if it is temporary and, and they've been very clear to, to follow what, what we saw in that memorandum from 2022 about um, exempting temporary products. Uh, it, I, I don't see a way in which they would, there would be a way in which temporary products would have to fall under Buy America as currently written. Yeah, the real the real key point is going to be that phrase that they made a, a um, made a point of of clarifying that it has to be incorporated into the into the project. So um, just keep that in mind when you look at look at all of this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and if you all have any any questions, please continue to submit them. We have only one or two left in the queue, so if, if you do have any, um, please feel free to ask. I know we do have a, good, a couple more minutes. Definitely here. Um, can you clarify the difference between raw materials used in a product? and components used to make a product? Oh. The inference is that the materials and the components may be treated differently. You know, I'll be honest with you, I'd have to go back and look at the raw materials section guys on that one um, and see if there's anything that we could pull out of that. Off the top of my head, I, I would just hesitate to try and answer that. Um, and steer somebody wrong. Yeah, um, and, and and they really only talk about raw materials in terms of if you if you th there are raw materials that are exempt things like dirt and fill. Um, they make clear that those raw materials are exempt. Um, again, once you once you begin to um, change or shape any material, it usually it typically falls under that manufactured products bucket. Um, so. That, but as Kathy said, it's up, something we can definitely follow yeah, up on. If there, there is a whole, an entire page, and I can certainly read from it right now. But for those, for whoever asked the question, if you go to that Federal Register link that was part of um, ATSA's article, it's page 57769 that goes into really lengthy detail about um, what happens when you combine raw materials. Um, and that may be, there may be some information there. It's a quite lengthy section. I hate to take everybody else's time to read it, but again, page 57769, um, take a look at that and reach out to us um, if you still have a question, but that may be the best use of everyone's time. Uh, question here, uh, with October 23rd uh, being the date the final guidance goes into effect, how do we deal with projects materials through October 22nd? Um, and my initial thought would be that's kind of a, uh, talk to see what what is your state DOT well, thinking? Yeah, so or... Actually, there is language in there. So if, if you have a project, it depends on the obligation of the project that's mm -hmm. been obligated um, between now and, and October 23rd, um, you fall under the guidance that came from that OMB memo from April of last year. And I know it's like clear as mud, right? Um, but you'd fall under those requirements, but there are some caveats to that whether or not the project is substantially changed through planning or design. Um, so as Cameron said, I would definitely talk to your state DOT just to make sure everything's clear, but they do try to distinguish between projects that are obligated now prior to the effective date um, of these new, these new rules. Okay. Uh, and then I guess we're, we're kind of at the end of the queue here for questions. So just to give folks a few few more minutes here to, to get any thoughts in. Um, and again, we, we really want to stay away from, from touching on specific products here. Um, but what do you think ATSA members can do in order to best prepare for, for what, what's coming? And, and I know there's this Buy America question has been out here for a, a year or two now. Um, but what do you think, as far as being an advocate, or what do you think the best ways for them to, to get their message across is right now? So I, I just to reiterate, I think there's two, we have two key um, um, steps that are that are in front of us. 
One will be um, USDOT issuing their implementation rules for this guidance um, and all of us taking a look at it and finding out where there may be some pressure points where we can work with US USDOT. Um, but then also OMB, and I know it's gonna drive you all crazy, but OMB made it clear that despite this final guidance, it's not really final, nothing's final and final, that they're gonna to continue to potentially revise all of this based on the experience that all of you have. So I think maintaining the contact that you have with your state DOTs is very important as we talked about, but also making sure that ATSA and folks like Cameron know what you're experiencing so that out here in Washington, they can be telling folks what's happening and maybe um, kind of have the pressure come from both sides if if there um, are some, some problem points, but it's gonna have to be a feedback loop, everybody. Um, you guys are on the ground tell us what's happening. Um, we'll let you know what the rules are. And then we're just going to have to kind of feel our way through this. Yeah. And I think a big thing too, is let your state partners know, uh, let state DOTs know what you're nervous about, Let get them your questions now, because as Kathy mentioned, we're, we're waiting to see something from USDOT and obviously the state DOTs work closest with USDOT. So let them know your concerns, let them know um, the questions you have that maybe we aren't able to answer um, and, and try to try to put the pressure on them to get answers as well, because they're going to be in the same boat, too. They don't want they don't want a lack of clarity. They don't want a lack of uniformity. So really try to push them as much as possible to get to get the um, the answers as possible. Um, yeah. And if you're finding some of you may do work um, where you're um, being um, kind of sorry for all the thunder, you're 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 cutting across different FHWA divisions. And if you find that there are inconsistencies, because it does happen, as you all know, again, um, that's going to be something that that you'll have to let us know. And we can try and work on that um, out here if there are any inconsistencies once we get that implementation um, guidance from, from federal highways. If you find um, that things just aren't as consistent as they should be across division offices, let us know and we can work on that. Um, please clarify. Uh regarding labor costs to produce construction materials or manufactured products. Um, so it would be the, the labor cost comes into that 55% rule for manufactured products. And it does focus on the cost of components. Um, what it does not allow for is uh, you including labor costs in manufacturing the product. Uh, and as we kind of touched on any, we believe that any, any labor cost in creating uh, the components for your manufactured product would be built into the cost of that product already. And, we wouldn't be splitting that out in our definition. Kathy, is that track for? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's nothing in the guidance that talks specifically about how to treat that, but I'm just, again, presuming that your cost, your labor cost to produce the component is part of the cost of the component that you'll be reporting in order to meet that threshold. Um, I know some folks have asked to share this, um, and I guess I should mention that this, uh, this is being recorded, and so, all this information um, will be available to you all. I think early next week, we should be able to get this out to all of the folks on this call and to ask members. So if you do have a question about something you saw previously, um, happy to, to talk after, but um, this will also be available in full um, to everybody then. Um, question here, uh, how, uh, what about cost increases on jobs that were started years ago that not now fall under Buy America? Um, my understanding is that uh, if a project was started years ago, that it's past that point for Buy America, is that for, for this current iteration? Uh, so I guess a long, I guess the question is a long running project. How does Buy America affect this? Yeah, I, I, I would answer that it's going to depend on when the funds have ob were obligated because mm -hmm. the, the timelines that I mentioned as far as who, what rules you fall under is based on the obligation of those federal funds for that project. So if the funds were obligated years ago, um, you're going to fall under whatever was in place when those funds were obligated. Um, if it's a project that is ongoing and more funds have to be obligated, there is a provision in here that if it's the same project and it needs money within a calendar year, um, you know, there's there are some um, caveats to the to the Buy America, depending on when the funds were obligated, if that makes sense. If it was so if the funds were obligated prior to Build America, these new rules and that same project needs more money during that calendar year, um, then there would be a whole different set of rules for those for those products because it's the same project. So they are trying um, in some ways to mm -hmm. limit um, the impacts for projects that are already 
ongoing. Um, and then, uh, Kathy, could you just share one more time that the page and the federal page number <laughs> for raw materials? Yep, yep. So, um, folks, go to the the discussion on um, combining raw materials, et cetera, was page five seven seven six nine. So, if you go to that link that was in that article, um, or if you just have the federal register um, from August twenty third, page five seven seven six nine, it's forty one pages, and and I know that sounds um, onerous, but for those of you that have individual um, interests, construction materials, manufactured products, raw materials, um, it is pretty easy to find those sections that apply to you and you don't have to slog through the other pages. Um, so I, I really would recommend that that you you take a look at that. If anything, it will help you formulate your questions that you need to ask your state DOT um, or your other partners. So um, page 57769 on the raw materials and hopefully that that helps. If not, whoever's asking the question, please you know feel free to reach out and I just hate to read all that in front of everybody. Now that I need glasses, everybody, I've 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 crossed I've crossed into that. <laughs> so, um, and I think unless I'll give another minute or two here to get any last question, where it's like we're at the the end of our questions. But um, I, I guess if Kathy, if you can look into your your crystal ball and and do you think that this this I guess kind of if you want to give us the political side of this, where where is this all coming from and, and and do you think there's any way if we do see a, a change in, in the White House or Congress in, in, a, in a year or two's time um, that this could this could change at all or is this here to stay? Um, so that's a really interesting question. You know, it's hard to find a politician that is against Buy America, right? I mean, we all want to see American industries thrive and 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 uh, folks put to work. And that's the goal of the um, of the provisions. Um, I do think you find some sensitivities among members as far as just the complication and just the realities of some of these things, supply chains, et cetera. Um, and you saw that with members of Congress reaching out um, as OMB was putting this guidance together, making clear that you know the costs, delays, all those kinds of things were very important to members of Congress. So I don't know that I see them going away entirely and going back to where they were pre-IIJA. But I do think, again, as you guys experience um, the implementation of all this, you know, there's always opportunities to have a discussion with Congress about, um, you know, making making sensible modifications. I think going back to the way things were probably is not in the cards, um, but there may be opportunities just to, to kind of bring some reality to the discussion on the Hill if we need to. Awesome. Well, I think with that, um, again, uh, this is going to be recorded and will be available for all ASA members to rewatch, I think, early next week. Um, and if you do have any questions, please reach out to me. Um, a few of you did put uh, did ask some questions that are kind of more specific and in the weeds. I, I wrote them down and I'll follow up with you kind of offline just so I can make sure I have um, kind of a better answer for you. But if you if anyone does have any questions after this or wants to talk more about this, um, Buy America has become my life. So uh, I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, and me and Kathy talk for almost daily at this point about it. So if you have any questions for either of us, um, please feel free to send them along. We're always happy to talk more, um, happy to talk to your companies or state DOTs or whoever it is um, about this. So um, with that, uh, thanks everybody. And again, please reach out if you need anything and um, have a good rest of your evening.